All right. So um, this, to give you some background, this talk is what I, is the talk I gave at the R Studio conference in Austin last week. Um, so yeah, they were all set up as like twenty minute talks, um, and I was sort of in like the programming track. So this will sort of be geared towards more towards that than like visualization or data science or something like that. So um, yeah, today I'm so. If, if you don't know me, my name is Jim Hester. I'm, an R, I'm a software engineer at RStudio, and I sort of work on the open source development of the Tidyverse packages. And today, um, we're going to be talking about uh, software dependencies. So just as a baseline, all R code has uh, at least some dependencies. Even if your R script doesn't depend on any packages except for the base packages, um, it has it's that the R itself depends on uh, system libraries, which depend on the compiler tool chain, et cetera. So it's really impossible to have complete dependency-free um, script. And in this case, the uh, golden retriever is our, is our weak link. That's the dependency that's failing. Um, and of course, dependencies also break. So this is the like evil downside of dependencies. So uh, some examples are in like the JavaScript community, um, there was the left pad package, which the maintainer pulled uh, his package from from the the package repository, and that took down like millions of, of sites. And then another example is in the event stream package, the maintainer there was actually a malicious maintainer that added um, credential um, harvesting code to to his package, and that that caused, as you would expect, lots of issues. Um, so and then. And, Apart from these sort of more malicious actions by maintainers, dependencies can also cause issues just due to do the thing called bit rot, which basically happens when um, code that was previously working, maybe five years ago, um, you run it again, you up your dependencies are updated in the meantime, and that causes um, bit rot, so, uh, which means your, your code no longer works because the dependencies have changed in, in the interim. And in the Python community, there, this is an XKCD comment, comic that's basically showing all the different ways that you can install packages in Python. So another reason that dependencies are difficult is because you, when you're trying to install them, maybe there's system requirements and it causes a bunch of mess. So as a result, um, this is sort of the, the idea of dependency hell, where you, you try, all you really want to do is run your code and you're just running into problem after problem with, with your dependencies instead. So as a result of all these issues, some people have proposed sort of a less is more approach to dependencies. And um, while I think less is more is a very good philosophy um, for architecture, for dependencies, I don't think it's, it's a great solution. Uh, and sort of the rest of my talk is, to, is explaining why this might be. So um, the first reason is not all dependencies are, are equal. You, you shouldn't treat all dependencies as the same. And some examples of this, um, it, this is uh, the CRAN landing page of the rlang package. And you can see um, the, this package depends only on R itself. It doesn't depend on any additional packages. Um, in contrast, the CNV scope package uh, depends on over 40 additional packages on both uh, the CRAN repository and, bio, and Bioconductor. So clearly we shouldn't compare, we shouldn't treat uh, the rlang package and CNV scope as the same in this respect. And another way to compare packages would be um, to look at their installation time. So this is uh, the CRAN landing page of the glue package, which I maintain. And uh, the column that's being highlighted is the, um, the time to install the package on CRAN's build machines. And if you look at the times, you see um, they're all pretty low. The, the largest is 24 seconds on their machine. In contrast, if you look at the readr package, which I also maintain, um, this package, the install times are much, much higher here. So um, there are at least 200 seconds, if not, uh, I think the highest is like 700 seconds. So clearly um, over 10 minutes and 24 seconds are, is a huge difference. We shouldn't treat these two packages as the same in this respect. Another way that package, packages can differ is um, by the binary installation size. So CRAN builds uh, package binaries for all the packages on CRAN. And these 
when, you, when these binaries are available, you can just download the binaries. You don't have to compile the package yourself. So you actually don't need to worry about the installation time um, for binary packages. However, the binary size can vary a great deal. And this is important in case you have a slow internet connection or you're low on disk space or other reasons like that. So if we look at the various sizes of binaries, the, the smallest binary on CRAN is this AWS package, which is less than 10 kilobytes in size. The largest is this H2O package, which is over 100 megabytes in size. And if we look at the Bioconductor repository, the largest package in Bioconductor is over four gigabytes in size. So clearly, there's a huge uh, difference between four gigabyte package and 10 kilobyte package. So treating all these packages as the same doesn't make a lot of sense either. Another way that packages can, can differ is, um, is that some packages you are rely on only R code to, to install. And in that case, all you need is R install to install them. However, some packages, and some packages have compiled code, so you need, uh, you need a compiler on your system to install those packages. But in addition, some other packages uh, also need additional system libraries to install. So this is the RGDAO package. And this uh, highlighted block below is showing is, is instructions for configuring and installing all of the system requirements needed for, to install the RGDAO package. And clearly, uh, a huge uh, text block like this that's going through all the different um, configuration options and a package that only needs R, R itself to install are clearly very different in this respect. Another example is the RJava package, which on, these are uh, three separate um, Thread, stack overflow threads of people trying to install or use the R Java package on Mac OS, um, Linux, and Windows. So clearly R Java is much more difficult, R Java is sort of a special case, but it's much more difficult to install and use than, than most other packages on CRAN. So we shouldn't really treat R Java and, all, and other packages the same in this respect. So, to go through all of that, that's basically just trying to drive home the point that we should not treat each dependency as, as equivalent. If, if one package depends, you should really look at what the specific dependencies are um, for your package, uh, rather than just treating a package that has five dependencies and another package that has five dependencies as equivalent. So really, what should we do instead if we're not going to be just treating these all these packages as equivalent? We should try to do a balance between. So what happens if you have a dependency, what are you trying to balance? I think you're trying to balance two, two sort of separate uh, things. First, it, uh, taking a dependency on a package gives you uh, more features, more bug fixes from the dependency, and more testing because that dependency is being used and tested uh, separate from your package or project. Um, but things that you, you sort of lose are you have this additional installation time to install the dependencies, additional disk space for the, to install and store the dependencies. And if those dependencies change, you can have potentially more breakage of your package. So you gain um, sort of your own developer time because you don't have to re-implement these features yourself, but you lose some generality. And I think it's really important that this isn't like a yes or no binary uh, answer it really depends on your package and your project um, and the dependencies that you're considering as to where this, this, uh, this balance uh, weighs out. So I think really you need to uh, consider your, the actual users of your package or of your project when you're doing this, uh, this weighing. So if the primary users of your package are other package developers, um, in that case, the install time is somewhat costly because those package developers have to install your package and all of its dependencies in order to test their package. And then in addition, um, smaller, more feature, less featureful packages are often easier to depend on because um, there's fewer surface area for the package to break. And in this context, really like stability of, of the dependency package is more important than how many features it has. So if your users are really package developers, I, I think you want to err more on the side of fewer dependencies. However, if your users are more data scientists or statisticians that are installing your package in, to use in scripts or maybe in Shiny applications, um, 
In that case, the install time is relatively cheap. Uh, the, the users are only going to install your package and its dependencies maybe once or twice. And they often will have some of, especially if your dependencies, dependencies are packages that are widely used, like, like dplyr or data table or rlang or something like that, that is it's one of the top packages on, on CRAN, um, those packages are often already installed on the user's machine. So um, depending on them really isn't bringing any additional uh, work, any additional ins installation time. And in this context, really, I think features are the most important thing. Another thing to keep in mind when you start thinking about re-implementing features that are in dependency is sort of this idea of uh, illusionary superiority. So um, this isn't actually related to programming or, or statistics at all. This is a sort of general psychological phenomenon where people often uh, overrate their own abilities in, in, in given uh, tasks. So some examples are in teaching ability, there was a survey in 1977 of uh, the faculty at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And in that survey, they asked them uh, if they were in the top 25% or the top 50% of faculty in teaching ability. And 68% of the surveyed faculty said they were in the top 25%. And 90% said they were in the top 50%. So clearly, a vast majority of the people are overrating their own abilities uh, in this case. And the same thing in driving skill, um, 93 of people in the US and 63% of people in, in Sweden for this given survey put themselves in the top 50% of driving ability. So again, clearly people are overrating their abilities compared to sort of the whole population. So how does this relate to sort of removing dependencies? So really, you, and, and I should mention, this doesn't really, this applies to basically everyone. I, can, I don't exclude myself at all from this. I think this is very easy for people to do. Um, so I think this really results in, you, you tend to overestimate your, your abilities to re-implement the, the features and, and uh, underestimate the, the uh, introduction of new, of new novel bugs when you're doing that re-implementation. People think that they can, that it'll be easy to re-implement the features and that they won't introduce new bugs. And often this is definitely not the case. Another thing sort of to go along with this is that if a package is being used, it already exists, has existed for a long time and is being used regularly in the real world, um, that's basically like free testing uh, for that code. Not because those, those package authors are necessarily better or worse at programming than, than you might be, but because real people have been using it for that length of time and as a result, a lot of bugs have, have surfaced and then been fixed. So really do not uh, discount the ability, uh, the, the, the ability of, of code that it's, that's existed for a long time to be less, to have fewer bugs. So really all of this um, boils down to the fact that, that less is not always more in terms of dependencies. So sort of the, so let's say you, you are interested, knowing all of this, you are still very interested in sort of lowering your dependency weight in your package. I think still the quantification of, of those dependencies is critical for making informed decisions about which dependencies you want to keep or remove. And so how do you quantify a dependency? So I have this package uh, that I've been working on. It depends. It's only on GitHub right now. Um, but this package is, the goal is sort of to help you quant to measure and quantify the, the dependencies in your project or package. So it does, I guess, four things. First, it assesses all of the dependencies that you're using in your project. Second, it lets you measure uh, the weights of each individual dependencies across, to, across a wide variety of metrics. Uh, third, it lets you visualize um, the proportion of these weights in your whole project so you can give some good idea, get a good idea of which dependencies are contributing most to the overall weight of your pro uh, project. And lastly, uh, they allow you to locate all the dependencies to assist in removing them if, if you decide that's the route to go down. So first, how do you determine uh, the usage of, of your dependencies? So there's two, 
functions, one for projects and one for packages. So the first one, dep usage proj, is for um, determining all the dependencies in a project. So we can use this in, and we just give it a path to a project. In this case, this is the tidyverse dashboard project. Um, and then we're counting all of the dependencies in that project. You can, and this is actually showing basically what this function returns is for each function call in the project, it gives the package that it, that function call was in and what function call it is. So here we're just counting uh, function calls for each package. The base package, so we see the base package has the most. Um, the NA here is functions that I defined in this project, which is why they don't have a name. Uh, and then we see the per package is being used a bunch and uh, the glue package, etc. So you can easily get a feel for which packages you're using a lot uh, with this function. Um, another way you could tabulate this, this data is by, for each um, dependency, count the number of times each function is used, and then here I'm only taking the top function for each package. So this is basically showing which, for each package, which function am I using the most. Um, so we can see from the base package, I'm using the dollar sign subset. Uh, from the per package, there's two that are tied, this map DFR function and the pipe operator, double pipe operator. Um, and you, so this is, gives you a good way to see which functions am I using the most uh, from each package. And then the equivalently, you can do this with other package, with packages on your machine. So if I look at the DevTools package, um, we can see that DevTools uses, again, a lot of functions from the base package, but also from other functions within Dev to find it within DevTools, and then uh, Git2R use this package load, etc. So this gives you a nice quantitative way to see exactly how many function calls are coming from, from each of your dependencies. So what, now that you sort of got an idea of which dependencies might be uh, important to look at, how do you actually weigh these dependencies across some of those metrics that we talked about earlier? So this depth weight function returns a tibble, which is just a data frame of um, 25 columns of various metrics. And here I'm, I'm weighing two packages, the dplyr and data.table. Data um, and we can go through, because 25 columns is a lot to fit on one slide, we can, I'm going to break it down so we can see what, what some of these actually are. Um, so the num user and num dev is the number of user dependencies. So these are dependencies that users typically need to install to use the package. And dev dependencies are, are dependencies that you really only need to work on the package itself. Those are what developers would need to use. Um, bin self and bin user is the and bin dev is the binary size for the package itself. Bin user would be all the package and all of its uh, user dependencies, and bin dev would be the package and all of its development dependencies. And then install self, install user, install dev would be the median installation time. So back at that CRAN landing page, it basically um, it pulls that, that information from, from the CRAN landing page and gives you uh, an idea of the installation time for the package itself, the, the user, and the, and the development dependencies. Other things returned by the, the weights function, depth weights pump function, is um, the number of cr weekly CRAN downloads for each package, the number of functions exported in the package, which gives you some idea of the, of the scope of, overall scope of the package. So again, I, earlier I talked about um, it's often easier to depend on smaller scope packages. So especially if you're only using a few functions from a package that has tons of functions, maybe it's easier to remove those dependencies. Um, the weekly downloads to give you some idea of the popularity of the package and sort of, again, popular packages aren't necessarily bet, better, better programmed, but they're used so much more that a lot of bugs can be fixed are found and fixed just as a result of the popularity. Um, and the first CRAN release and the last CRAN release to again show you how how mature a given package is. So if it's been on CRAN for a long time and it's um, it's more likely to have fewer bugs. And then uh, releases the last releases in the last 52 weeks. 
which gives you some idea of sort of how actively developed the package is. Um, there's also some information from GitHub. So this is showing the open issues on GitHub, which gives you some idea of sort of how many outstanding things are, are, are known about and have yet to be fixed. Uh, the stars which, and forks, which is uh, sort of a, a proxy for popularity, I guess. And how last updated is when it was last updated on GitHub, which gives you some idea of when, uh, sort of how actively developed the package is. So those are all about weighting um, the, the various dependencies. The, the next part is about visualizing those, those weights. So there's two functions to do this right now, um, one to visualize the installation times and one to visualize the binary sizes. So in this plot, the left-hand facet is the, uh, the user dependencies. And so this is for the dplyr package. And the right-hand plot is for the development dependencies. So really, we should mostly focus on the left-hand plot. And we can see this is for installation time. So this is really showing that um, when you're installing dplyr, most of the installation time is spent compiling dplyr itself. The dependencies take a relatively small amount of time to compile. In, I mean, in contrast, if you look at the, Question. yes. The uncomfortable with the definition. When I install the in my computer, it doesn't require So what am I Yeah, so um, this is for compiling the package. So when you install the package on your computer, you're installing a binary which is pre-compiled by CRAN. So you don't have to compile it in that case. Um, so that's actually what this next plot, which is showing the binary size. So this is much more relevant for your case because you're just downloading the binary. So the only thing that would really change the installation time in that case is um, how big it is, how big the binary is to download to your computer. So this is much more interesting. This is a much more useful plot for that case. Um, and in this case, the, the picture kind of changes. So dplyr now um, is about five megabytes in size. So with a relatively fast internet connection, it should download very quickly. Um, the BH package is actually much bigger binary size. So if you're just looking at the binary installation case, case this BH dependency is a much more, it, it contributes much more to the overall time to install than, than dplyr itself. And that's uh, sort of like one of my points. I'm glad you asked the, the question that um, you can't take one of these metrics as the, as the most important thing. It's really, you have to look at the whole uh, weight holistically and, and know who sort of who your most likely users are to to get an idea of of which dependencies are are, are the most uh, impactful so now you've sort of gone through this weighting and maybe you've looked at the the visualization and you've decided there's a package that you think you can can remove um, before you do that I think it's really important to make sure you do your best not to break any of your existing functionality. So before you do anything to remove the dependency, I think it's important to write as many tests for your existing functionality as you can. And only after sort of you've expanded this test suite, then uh, start replacing uh, the dependency. And to do that, you can use this function depth locate. So if you, so this is, and this actually, this dep locate function works on both packages uh, and, um, and regular projects. So you just give it a path, the, you give it the package, the dependency package that you want to locate and the path to your project, which can be again, either just a regular package or it could be a package or just a, an R project of any, of any kind. It could be a shiny app. It could be basically anything. Um, and this will look in all of the, the directories underneath that path for our for our um, our files and look in, in each of them for for that dependency. So if you run this on the console, you'll get an output like this. If you run this in the IDE, uh, it uses the marker pane in the IDE, so you get a nice you get output that looks like this. And then each of those lines you can click on, and the IDE will open the file. 
that corresponds to that line and take you directly to where that function is located. So um, this gives you a very nice way to find each of the, the cases you're using a given dependency and, and remove them pretty quickly. So sort of in conclusion, um, so the, this independence package lets you uh, measure the usage, uh, weigh each of your dependencies, plot them so you can see sort of their overall proportion, and then locate each, each of the calls to, to remove a dependency. And the sort of the broad ideas of, of, that I was talking about are you shouldn't treat all dependencies as equivalent. Um, they vary quite a bit, actually. Uh, in ver along various metrics, uh, really, you really need to measure and, and take a balanced approach to, to talking about dependencies. Uh, beware your own overconfidence when removing a dependency, and less is really not always more in this case. And that's, I guess, it. Oh, and the speakers, the, the uh, slides are at, at that location, speakerdeck.com, um, Jim Hester. So that's it. Happy to answer questions if people have any.